Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Humanities Podcasting Network Symposium. Um, today, we're going to be talking about structuring podcasts to facilitate learning. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Thorpe, and um, my podcast is called Chiroticast. It is a small operation, especially compared to my co-host who works with the New York Times, but um, we're happy with it. We have uh, a devoted audience that tunes in every week. Um, this week, we will be talking about um, kind of the podcast writ large in terms of how we approach learning and making big ideas applicable, and I'll spend a good amount of time talking about that. Um, and I'm going to use one of our episodes from the last year and a half, uh, episode 35 of Very Nietzsche New Year. You can probably tell from the title, it's not one of our more serious episodes. I decided to kind of keep it light for this presentation. I didn't want to get us really down into the more ominous, serious stuff that we often deal with. So um, just a word of introduction. Oh, I can't. My, oh there we go. Um, as I said, I'm the host of Chiroticast, and it is a weekly podcast about rhetoric and current events. And it is very current. When I say current events, a lot of times the um, podcast is about something that happened like in the last seven days. Carl Thorpe is kind of a silent partner in this endeavor. He is the producer of the show. And though we work together to produce the show, I am what's known as a solo caster. And that means the format of the show is me addressing the topic of the week instead of like a dialogue or a conversation. I don't do a whole lot of interviews. I've done once or twice, uh, one or two interviews, but for the most part, it's just me out there in the world of the internet uh, talking about whatever interests me. Um, so because of that, the shows run about 15 to 30 minutes long. And that's by virtue of the fact that it is just me. Uh, we don't want to beleaguer people with just one voice talking forever. You did enough of that in high school and college with somebody <laughs> lecturing you forever. So we keep it short. They're usually about 20 to 25 minutes. And we found that's a good amount of time to make things interesting, keep things interesting, and still make a solid point. Um... So Chiroticast is dedicated to taking big ideas and showing how they play out in the proverbial real world. Um, what we are concerned with is rhetoric and current events. And those are two things which are often seen as either difficult or irrelevant. Those are things that people are like, oh, that doesn't matter to me, that doesn't appeal to me, that doesn't make a difference in my life. And that's what we aim to address. Because we believe that a lot of these things that seem like they belong in the ivory tower, or they don't make any difference to me, or whatever people seem to think about them, they're just philosophical musings, or they don't affect my life they're actually really helpful in understanding the things that shape the world in which we live. So we're dedicated to taking these rhetorical ideas and tenets and making them applicable. So each week we address a new topic that brings something political or from pop culture into focus. And we have covered everything from book banning, CRT, Uvalde, and abortion, to superheroes, first day of school jitters, and April Fools. So we've got a very broad span of things from the very serious and, you know, something that you have to really kind of delve into to get to the kind of emotional um, center, to things that are 
very lighthearted and even silly um, because we feel like both of these things are important to, you know, living your life. Our ultimate goal is to take that ivory tower and bring it down a few notches because we believe that the things taught in those kind of impossibly out of touch classes like your upper division theory or your American oratory class or whatever class you took that you were like, oh my gosh, how does this apply to me? I'm never going to use this. Whatever it was are actually really applicable. And we try to show how the ideas that are bandied about in academic circles actually are really helpful to make sense of the world. And um, I think one of the things my co-host is going to be um, really helpful with and kind of tandem here is talking about how big ideas are something that we try to make useful and helpful across the board, right? We're taking big ideas and making them something we can all learn from. And I think that's something we have in common. So episodes tend to follow some basic patterns. Um, one, we will address a current event, usually very current, and put it into a rhetorical perspective. Or two, we will take a seemingly kind of effect rhetorical theory or theorist or concept and show how it helps to explain everyday life by applying it to something in the real world. And I always put real world in quotation marks because, like, what does that even mean, really? Um, so the episode I chose for today, uh, like I said, is definitely one of our more lighthearted episodes. I thought it would be fun to choose something verging on the silly. Um, you might think the title is a little bit uh, frivolous, but at the same time, it's like, Nietzsche, mm, is he really silly? Well, that's kind of the point we were trying to make. Uh, so in episode 35, we took a very famous philosopher and rhetorician and somebody who might seem kind of out of reach to your everyday listener, and we made him something that was easy to grapple with and something that you might even enjoy thinking about. So I have about a two-minute clip out of what was about a 25-minute episode, I think. Um, so I thought I would share that with you, and then we can talk about, like, what this was and how it worked. So let's give this a shot. The other part of Nietzsche's project that I think is useful to think about for 2021 is his idea of the Ubermensch. This is easily his most misconstrued idea. A lot of bad dudes have tried to paint this concept as some kind of superior human that will lord over the rest of us because of his innate characteristics. But that's not what it is at all. The Ubermensch is simply a person who can control the chaos around them and behave in an ethical manner. They can assess the discourse they find themselves in and master the matter at hand. They are master artists or teachers or athletes perhaps, but more importantly, they are self-actualized and recognize their own power over their circumstances. Now look, 2020 threw us a lot of curveballs. There were a lot of things outside of our control. So for 2021, what I wish for you is that you have the self-confidence to look at yourself and your situation and realize what is and is not in your control and take hold of your life. That may mean spending a bit less time stressing and a bit more time working out or playing with your pet. That may mean getting a bit more organized. That may mean spending an hour a day reading a trashy romance novel instead of doom scrolling. I want you to do what you need to do to bring some order to your chaos. This is a 21st century kind of discipline. Maybe it means more baking, going to bed earlier, making more time to chat with a friend. The world out there is a mess. Our lives have been chaotic. How will you take hold of the chaos and master it a bit? There are a lot of things you can't control. You can't control the politicians who are screaming about electoral fraud or when you will get the vaccine. You can't control the family members who will refuse to wear a mask in public and then have get togethers on the weekends. But there are things you can control. 
So for the New Year episode, we took a philosopher that is usually associated with nihilism and pessimism, and we turned him on his head. We talked about how Nietzsche's philosophy empowers us to be truth builders and to master the chaos around us. And as we all remember, coming off of the madness of 2020, and honestly, things haven't changed that much, but coming off of the madness that was 2020, that sounded pretty good, right? Like mastering chaos, building our truths. These are things that we kind of needed to hear coming out of 2020. So we took what seemed dismal and impossibly theoretical and made it real and optimistic. Um, so like I said, episode 35 was a particularly optimistic episode, but we have covered things like the inherent whiteness in the educational system and misogyny in the academy. And things like that don't necessarily lend themselves to such a positive spin. But each episode is geared to teach to a broad audience about challenging topics. More serious episodes, like one of our recent ones about the body as text, which dealt with um, the history of often women using the physical body as an argument, follow the same pattern. There is an idea or topic that is explained through the lens of a rhetorical theory or theorist, which shows how rhetoric is a useful concept. Now, if I were just telling you about this over lunch and we were just talking about it, uh, it would probably sound like this would appeal to a very limited audience because honestly, <laughs> how many people are that interested in rhetoric, right? But that's kind of the point. The whole podcast is to show that this subject does have a wide appeal and is of interest to everyone. And that's why we have listeners from all walks of life and from all over the globe, because we're serious about our goal. And that's to show that these ideas aren't just for professors who are sitting in their offices writing books that nobody will ever read, because there are plenty of professors doing that. There are a lot of people who are sitting in their offices writing books that only one or two people are ever gonna read. And we don't feel that's useful. Um, we truly believe that if ideas are going to be useful and beneficial, then they need to be something that are applicable to life in general. They need to be something that are accessible. So that's what we're working toward all the time. So our audience is multi-layered. We appeal to academics. Certainly there are a lot of people in the academy who tune in every week. I know we have a lot of professors who really like to listen to our show. We have a lot of students who tune in, tune in and that's kind of um, double layered there. Um, I've had lots of grad students email me and say, oh, I really appreciate your show. It's helped me kind of ground myself and what I think I'm gonna do and how I think I'm going to approach my dissertation or my thesis or my classes or anything like that. But I also know that um, professors have used my podcast in their classes to help explain concepts. So I know that people either in high school or in college have been exposed to the podcast um, as students because it's a learning tool uh, introduced to them by their professors. Um, there are professionals who listen to the podcast um, because they have found that it explains a particular concept that's useful to them in the working world. And then we have a lot of just lay listeners, people who are like, you know, this is really interesting. And this presented to me a unique and fascinating perspective that I just wouldn't have thought of on my own. And those are some of the most rewarding listeners because they'll reach out to me and be like, hey, that was really cool. I like that. More of that, please. And that's always really encouraging. So um, I'm going to turn this over to my co-host, Annie. Uh, in a minute, I would love to answer any questions that you have. Um, like I said, my approach was to kind of talk about this writ large about how I approach 
learning and the structure I take for the podcast um, and my goals for what I do when I'm thinking about my podcast. You can ask me questions here, or if you want to email me, I'm at Elizabeth at Kairoticast. That's K-A-I-R-O-T-I-C-A-S-T dot com. I would be happy to answer any questions via email. Um, but for now, I'm going to turn it over to Annie, and um, we will take questions at the end. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, that I've been so excited to hear about your show and subscribe and want to hear more. So let me quickly share my screen and get the slideshow going. And yes, I will start by, um, well, I'm just going to get this out of the way. Anyway, okay. So my name is Annie Galvin. And first of all, just thank you so much to to the HPN for organizing another great conference and having me here. And thank you all for taking an hour out of your Fridays to be here. So just a tiny bit about me before we get into another chapter of structuring podcasts to facilitate learning. So I currently work as the producer at the Ezra Klein Show, which is uh, a podcast that's based at New York Times in the opinion section. And in my last job, I co-created and produced a show called Public Books 101 at the magazine Public Books. And we're really proud of that show. I have such a warm place in my heart. That was more of a public scholarship show. For Public Books 101, we were basically trying to create the experience of an academic seminar in miniature. So we would have a host of each season and on each episode, two experts in the field. And so listeners hopefully would feel like they were sitting in on you know, a seminar with like the best people and we'd accompany that with discussion questions. So it was really fun to get, hear from folks who use it as a teaching tool. Um, oh, how do I go to the next? Oh, good. Okay. There we go. So I'm going to just say a tiny, tiny bit about our show. And then I'm going to get into some nuts and bolts of our production process. So the Ezra Klein show is the flagship interview podcast at the times. And it's hosted by Ezra Klein, who founded Vox, big media company, and also writes a weekly column, weekly-ish column for the opinion section. And so I think something that makes our show distinct is that we cover a ton of different topics. So politics is Ezra's comfort zone. So we do a lot of politics episodes, political scientists, journalists. We just had Rachel Maddow on the show. Uh, we also do respond to the news, not every week, but, you know, let's say when the Russia-Ukraine war started, we did like 10 episodes with people from Fiona Hill to Masha Gessen um, to Ukrainian philosophers, trying to give listeners a lens, like a really thorough lens, not just saying, here's what happened today, but like, here's a new way to think about it. We did the same uh, after Dobbs. So this was one of our episodes with legal scholar Kate Shaw. And then a lot of what I work on is kind of more in the humanities and social sciences. And one of my favorite recent episodes in this bucket was with the amazing scholar, Catherine Bond Stockton, and it was about gender and why gender has become such a salient conversation in the country, what people are afraid of with gender, and most importantly, what is exciting about you know, people from young kids through very old folks really kind of redefining and opening up the gender binary. And that one was really meaningful to me because I would have people say, you know, I sent this to my mom or I sent this to my grandma because it was both kind of challenging and approachable. And of course, some of our listeners hated it, but I actually took that as a compliment because uh, it's a touchy topic. And then sometimes we get lucky and we get folks like uh, Barack Obama. Okay, and so quickly, what are our show goals? Kind of like what Elizabeth was talking about with her show. Um, I would say three things. One, my favorite place to exist as kind of an alt act person is in the sweet spot between, on the one hand, deep um, intellectual rigor and curiosity, and then on the other, a kind of engaging quality and accessibility. So we try to live in that Venn diagram overlap where we're giving people something that's going to be stimulating and challenging and nourishing, but you know, not like eating your vegetables, not um, I don't know, prohibitively uh, jargony. And so that's really what we're trying to do. I always find that to be such an invigorating challenge in any kind of scholarly work. And then we, as I'm going to talk about in a second, we, these conversations are really purposeful. We do a ton of prep and we really want to give listeners something they won't get somewhere else. So if you've heard an author doing a, you know, a podcast book tour for their book, 
we really want to give folks something special that's different. And my most, the thing that warms my heart the most is when a guest will say, wow, I can't believe you saw that in my work. You know, nobody's ever really made that connection. And so that that's like when I'm proudest. And then finally, and this is more on the host, on Ezra. And if any of you host a, an interview or a conversation show, I'm curious whether you ever think about this, but I think he's really kind of one of the best interviewers in the business. Like I listened to his show for many years before working here, but he's really good at, in the first couple minutes of a conversation, kind of reading the room and figuring out, should I get on this person's energy level? Do I need to go down a little? Do I need to go up a little? He'll very occasionally stop people in the middle and just kind of like give them a tip, but that's very, very rare. But I think just really trying to cultivate a connection that's either intellectually sparky or sometimes very personal and vulnerable. Um, and I want to just quickly before I get into our production process, make a little disclaimer. I mean, this is my full-time job now. You know, I have 35 plus hours a week to work exclusively on the show, but I do have experience like many of you probably having a job that has a lot of other stuff and only having a few hours a week, ten, five to 10 to work on it, doing shows seasonally. We make two episodes a week, so it's a very grueling production schedule, but this is our full-time thing. We have a staff, we have resources. And what I want to do next is really share some things that I hope will help anyone's show. But again, this is this is like all I do. So <laughs> keep that in mind. Um, yes. And so the concept that I want to, this is just the one concept that I'm going to provide kind of to guide this. Um, what I like to think about what podcasts do as kind of knowledge creation mediums, let's say, is, and I'm talking about conversation podcasts here. I'm fascinated by the monocaster that Elizabeth does. Like I've never worked on that, but what I've done is conversation podcasts. And in my mind, what the way that, like what that kind of podcast does is it creates a productive friction between two brains, two personalities, two voices. And it uses that to surface ideas and tension and all those good things in a way that you really can't do in a solo authored article. So if anyone's, if you all are willing to uh, kind of pop into the chat for a second, I would love to hear, I'm obsessed with this question of form and medium. When you're thinking about informing or teaching an audience through a piece of writing versus a podcast, what do you think podcasts can do that writing can't do? I don't know if I can, can I see the chat? If anyone wants to pop in there and give an answer. I don't know if folks can chat, but yes, Kim, bring the conversation to life. I love podcasts because I love humans <laughs> and I just love hearing people talk to each other. And there's something inherently different about that. Anika, yes. I mean, you can, you can learn while driving, while doing the dishes, while folding laundry, walking the dog. I think those are both really great. Avon, thank you so much. Follow tangents and make connections in the moment. Yes, totally. It's this kind of constantly like unspooling back and forth dialogue. And, you know, when you write that, that is a part of it, but then you just put the thing out and you're like, well, it's out. Of course people respond and that's great. But I love those moment to moment thinking on your feet, challenging each other. So I love that Avon. And then I'll just finish with Dan here. Um, in terms of it being a conversation, two or more brains. Yes, I love multiple brains. They can create something new. Yes. So we always want to have people with different perspectives. And again, I think that magical improvisation is really cool. All right. So back to this. Uh, so yeah. So if you just keep that phrase productive friction in mind, that, that's all you need to do here. <laughs> um, and so how do we do this? Now I'm going to get into the nuts and bolts of production. And I think if those of you who produce podcasts and by talking to other producers, I've learned this, every show, the production process looks so different. And some shows really focus on post-production, like Song Exploder, one of, you know, I think the most formally tight and wonderful shows, um, like they do so much after, right? They have to take a massive interview with the musician and like compress it down and I don't know if folks know that show, you know, other interview shows that I've worked with the producers on do a ton of editing to make things super tight. For us on EKS, what we do is we front load a lot of the work. And so Ezra has described our prep process as the superpower of our show, which sounds kind of dorky, but just that it's the important part. And so again, this is my full-time job, but I read usually a full book a week. Um, 
And we write these <laughs> sort of at the times like legendary prep documents, which are anywhere from 10 to, I think I've gone up to 30 pages, single spaced. Some of that's quotes, but most of it is my own original writing every week. So I produce one episode a week and I do this. And so actually what I do is really similar to uh, writing a dissertation chapter or an article. It's deeply scholarly and I find that really fulfilling. But the thing that, and I wonder if other folks um, think about this in their podcasts, the thing that I love about podcasting versus writing, and I've always been a writer, I'll always identify with writing and love producing and reading it, but podcasts are such a collaborative intellectual project. So for every episode, I'll talk to Ezra at least two times, and we're really trying to put our brains together and stretch the range of ideas that we can get at in the show. And um you know, again, I just, I just find that like when, when, in, when I'm happy with an episode, it feels like it came out of a deep collaboration, not just one person's mind. And so I don't know if folks want to talk about that more later. I just, again, I love the formal and medium questions. And so that's interesting to me and okay, super quick. I'll move on. But the goal of our prep is to basically be a second brain for Ezra. And uh, we had a guest in the past, Annie Murphy, Paul, who calls this process looping, which is kind of taking an idea and cycling it or a set of ideas and cycling them back and forth between two brains. So, um, so the idea then grows and gets richer and gets challenged. So looping is a very inefficient process. It's like the opposite of what artificial intelligence does, but it's things that we as humans are very good at. And I think it's really fun when you're producing podcasts to do that. Okay. So this is going to look kind of crazy, but I thought I would just give a quick screenshot from a prep document. And this is by far the hardest episode I've ever prepped. Really quickly, it's with this um, woman, Erica Bakiaki, legal scholar. She describes herself as a pro-life feminist, which might seem like a bit of a contradiction in terms, but that's it. And she basically has a book about, I'm not going to summarize the whole book. A lot of it I really agreed with, but she's very critical of casual sex culture, uh, hormonal birth control. She literally thinks we should basically go back to the rhythm method and not put hormones in our bodies at all. And abortion, very anti-abortion, some exceptions. And so this was like a massive prep because we really wanted to get it right. I read the book deeply. I spent more time on this than usual, but just, you know, what we do is we have kind of an overview, a conversation theory, which I'm going to talk about in a second. And then usually I'll try to pull out some core themes and insights of book, and I'll kind of synthesize them, but also put my own, um, you know, spin on them. And again, when I was working on Public Books 101 for five to 10 episode hours a week, I would do kind of a similar thing. I wouldn't be able to read the whole book, let's be honest. I would not be able to write 30 pages, but, you know, I would, I would just try to get as much as I could and really try to organize the core ideas that I wanted to engage with, but also my own editorial response to the book in one place, kind of before I even wrote questions. So that's something I think folks might want to think about. Um, and so I want to just talk for a second about this thing. I've never heard about this in prep, but it's something that Ezra and my colleague Roger developed together. The most important part of every prep, and I think that other folks could kind of borrow this, um, is what we call the theory of the conversation. And the reason we do this is because we don't want to just go in and say, hey, this was interesting. Why did you write this book? Like, and those are fine questions, but we really want to have a theory. What is the core idea here that we want to get out and query? Um, how does this fit in with our show? Like we could have a million different conversations with let's say Margaret Atwood, who I've worked on, but like, what's the Ezra Klein show angle? What's the lens? And I'll say that the theory of the conversation, I think of it a bit like the intro and thesis statement of an academic article, it's always the last thing that I write, but I jot down notes while reading. So in a sense, it's like the thesis of the conversation. And we refine this, I'll write it for Ezra and then we'll talk and we'll change it, but it's kind of a, almost like a pitch or a proposal for what we're doing. Um, and this real quick, basically this is, I wrote a really long theory of the conversation here. Um, not going to go through it, but basically this is part of it. You know, I highlight the really important things. And then the yellow here is Ezra commenting. Um, he engages with the doc and he'll make comments and then we'll use that to uh, either write questions or talk more. And again, really tough conversation because we knew our listeners were going to absolutely hate like 50 to 75 to 100% of her ideas. So how do you do that in a way that's going to really challenge her, but also really bring these ideas out? Because this is the politics of abortion that once uh, Roe fell, 
we are thinking that the right might start to take up. So that's essentially why we wanted to do this conversation. Um, so second, I wanna talk for a second about structuring questions, because again, we try to make our questions so purposeful that we don't actually do a ton of structural editing after the fact. We really want the conversations, kind of like what Dan was saying and Avon, we want them to feel organic. We don't want it to feel like a puzzle that someone's rearranged, right? Um, and so something that I think we all do as academics when we're planning a seminar is we scaffold. We want to make sure at first we get out the core concepts, um, the core ideas, and then we build on that. Um, Ezra really likes to use kind of short quotes to draw out the guests. So I often will just write down a bunch of those while I'm reading, not a whole paragraph, but you know, you said this, tell me more about that. And then the last thing for our show, pushback is really, really essential. Again, that friction. We have a lot of people on that we disagree with. I mean, reading Arab Kabakiaki's book, there were sections where there was like, I was like that emoji with the steam coming out of my nose, but we want her there for a reason. And so a lot of what I was thinking about was like, how do we be fair, but also push back? And we love to use data and empirical research to really back up that pushback. And we, I, I, I've, I'll show you in a sec. I put that in the prep so Ezra has it at hand. And so I'm just gonna give, this is a quick screenshot of a line of questioning for Erica. Um, she basically thinks we should not have sex until we get married. She has this phrase, sex for sport, which is something she's very critical of. So I, I don't necessarily need to read all of these, but you know, why do you think people have sex for sport, not just procreation or bonding? Like, what are those? Why do you think people do that? Because a lot of people do that, right? <laughs> and why are they wrong? Just a small technical thing, we put uh, follow-ups in parentheses so that Ezra knows it's like nested beneath the last one. Um, and then why should sex be for procreation? One thing that for me was entirely absent from her book was pleasure. It's like, well, some people like to have sex because they like to have sex. Is that wrong? And then finally, like, if you think premarital sex is hurting women, then what should we do about it? Should we make it illegal like cocaine is? Or should we make people pay a fine? Or should we try to launch some massive cultural project to basically roll back the clock to the 1940s? Like her book did not have great answers. So this was a lot of the pushback. And then um, I'll just show quickly one thing that I did was I was I wanted to say, well, this is such a minority view. I literally don't know anyone old or young in my life who thinks this. And it turns out that 84% of Americans think casual sex is fine. Even over half of Christians say that. And so we really wanted to come armed with this data to say, well, your views are so out of step with people. Like, well, uh, what do you what do you do about that? Um, and then let me see how we're doing on time real quick, because I don't want to like take forever here. Um, yeah, let's let's play a really a super quick uh, clip. And what, what I'm playing here is I want you all to hear a little bit of how Ezra pushed back and what he's doing here really came out of the prep. And I do want to say Ezra reads everything. It's not just like me serving this up. He reads the book. I read the book. But this was something that I came up with. So let's listen. I think this actually gets to the nut of it because I, I want to keep what the goals of different people in this conversation are very clear. So I, in the in the abortion conversation we just had, you made an argument there that if we didn't have abortion, people would use contraception more effectively, more nearly universally. I don't really agree with that. I think there's actually quite good evidence out of places like Delaware. There are very good uh, programs that have been put forward where contraception use actually does get abortion rates down. But even if I grant the argument here, I think it's important to ask the question of what is the end? I think the reason a lot of people want there to be rights to all kinds of contraception, right, including IUDs and and, and things that, that I, I do disagree with you on the evidence here, I think are much more effective than natural methods and much easier to follow. But in addition to that, that if these things fail or if somebody fails to use them or if somebody is in a somewhat coerced situation emotionally or otherwise where they're not easy to use or if they end up in a situation that could be harmful for their health, they have the ability to continue charting their own life's course that's why you end up at something like the equilibrium that that many liberals have now. And um, and I could play more, but the point here is that if she's saying, you know, using natural fertility methods, like tracking your cycle and abstaining from sex for X number of days, if she thinks that A, you need that and no, no like abortion, or sorry, no contraceptive pill, and you can't have access to abortion if it goes wrong. And there's a very high failure rate, um, 
especially among teenagers for the rhythm method, let's say, like, how is that good for women? And I'm not going to play it, but Ezra goes on to give data from a New York Times study that looks at the typical abortion patient. And it's usually someone who is poor, who doesn't have much um, education, who is unmarried. So the question that he got to was like, how does this help this person, right? And so that was pushback that came out of our dialogues um, about her ideas. And then finally, I'll just go through this quickly because again, we do we do edit. I spend a lot of time, but we don't do a ton of structural rearranging because we want the structure to be sound before he goes into the studio. The one quick tip that I love to give about editing, I like to edit like a listener, not an editor. So I always do my first listen on a walk. I download the MV3 to Dropbox on my phone. I open up the notes app. We are lucky to live by a nice trail in Charlottesville, Virginia. I take a long walk and take notes because I wanna listen like the way I listen when I'm listening. I, I'm not gonna be sitting at my computer looking at a transcript. So that's just a, it's a way to actually build some exercise and, and nature into your day, but I can listen so much better. And what am I listening for? Basically, am I lost? Am I confused? Am I getting bored? Does there feel like some structural oddity that is throwing me off? And those are the notes I make. And then I go into a transcript and you know, implement those. And then we do Pro Tools. So that's all. All right. And so thank you so much for listening. I hope that wasn't too long. But um, like Elizabeth, happy to take questions um, about, you know, kind of crossing the academic public divide, our prep process, editing, anything else uh, process wise. And so thank you so much for listening. And yeah, Elizabeth, you want to open it up to questions from the group? I have a bunch of questions for Elizabeth, but I'm going to wait. <laughs> so other folks, please spare spare us from having to hear me talk more <laughs> at the moment or ask questions. Annie, I have a quick question for you. Is it okay if I just unmute myself and ask? Yeah. Oh, yes, please. We should have said that. Okay. Thank you, Kim. Um, I want to know, you said you edit the transcript? first and then you edit in Pro Tools? Tell me how, how you do that. How does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'll say on my last podcast, we didn't get a transcript till the very end because the primary goal of having a transcript was accessibility. But because we're at the Times, we have an incredible fact checker. And so the kind of one of the main reasons for the transcript is for the fact check. And um, and so so we get a transcription of the raw audio for every episode. And then what I do is I go on my walk, I you know have my notes, then I go to the transcript and I sort of import them in. And we basically say, if something is definitely cut, like my dogs are barking from Ezra Ocha's lot, my kids are screaming, we mark that in red, that's a definite cut. Any editorial cuts I make will be in orange. And then our fact checker is going through and commenting when there's a fact issue. And then we figure out how to cut. And then I work in Pro Tools. We have an engineer who also does the majority of the Pro Tools. And we kind of use the script as like a guidebook. So it's like, oh, blah, 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 here's a, you know, here's a red, here's an orange, sometimes a structural move. So that's something, and I'm having made a podcast on essentially a budget of zero dollars <laughs> on iPhones, I know that transcripts are expensive, although there are AI services. We use those if we have a really fast turn. So there are cheaper AI services. I find a transcript really helpful when editing, um, but I know a lot of people just go straight into Pro Tools. And so either way is fine, but that's a great question. I'm also really curious about this process now. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sorry, I hope it's not confusing, yeah. Um, yeah, just like, so your raw audio gets transcribed. <laughs> And that, like, I assume there's timestamps with that to help you then go into the file and cut whatever needs to be cut without re-listening to it all. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so one more thing, and again, I absolutely did not have this at Public Books, but we use a service called 3Play, and it's it's hard to explain, but it's really amazing because it's like you can find something in the transcript and click on it and it will play it. And so I use that to hear, is this cut possible? But it's not necessary because my colleague who does the same thing has never worked in Pro Tools and has no idea how audio works. So he just looks at the transcript. He's not doing that. So I think, 
I, so timestamps can be helpful if you want to go into the raw audio and just listen, because sometimes cuts don't work. And that's so hard with fact check. Like if there's a number we need to take out, I'm sure you all know this. It's not like print where you just do find and replace and you're like, oh, it's 50, it's not 56, it's 86%. <sighs> but I think if you have the timestamps, then you can go into Dropbox or Pro Tools and just listen for that. Um, um, does that make sense? I don't know. I would, sorry. replay is like a huge luxury. I would basically ignore that unless it's something you're familiar with. But I think, yeah, I think being able to hear is good. Um, um, isn't, yeah. isn't that what Descript does? I mean, yeah, that's what, what I was going to bring up too. Yeah. Oh, D yeah. Descript does it too. Yes, thank you. Absolutely, which is the AI much cheaper. Thank you yeah. so much for bringing that up. Yeah, thanks, Trikan. I was going to bring that up too because that's how I've been doing it for the last. Yes. Since I started you. wanting to do transcripts, and I know transcripts have come up a bunch, so like, why not mention right. it? Uh, I mean, I I pay ten dollars a month right now for my descript, so it's not there is a free version, but it limits right. how many hours I pay ten dollars yeah. a month. But you know, on the scale of cost, that's not out of my reach. Um, yes. And. Uh, so I transcribe, it transcribes my raw data, and then basically I edit my transcript and my video, like the audio at the same time. And that even right. works for like doing the, the cutting out your stumbles and cut, like, it's not just right. for, it's helpful for moving it around if you want to do that and cutting, you know, cutting for content. But uh, I also do all, you know, it removes ums and uhs automatically. And it, you know, you have to correct the transcript because it's AI. It's not like the one you're getting, Annie, I'm sure is has a human being looking at it and therefore has we use some... AI too yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but thank uh, you I'm oh sorry no I was just yeah. gonna say but I find it very I, I really do like I like that a lot now and then I find and then I end up with a mostly okay transcript and an edited episode at, with about the same amount of time as just editing the episode which yes is a I'm huge change I'm so glad that both of you brought that up because I think just descript is a great one it's so much cheaper and it absolutely does the exact same thing. So thanks, yeah. Uh, how does the uh, Descript work with multi-track audio, like uh, multiple people? Uh, I'm asking because uh, Descript doesn't work with uh, Indian accents and uh, uh, oh. people speaking in Indian languages. So I don't get to use it much, but uh, I, I'm really curious to know because they've been saying that they're, they're trying to work with other accents as well. So I just want to be prepared in case it happens for us. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think I think that's a huge problem with AI, like voice to text stuff in general, um, that it's very biased toward, you know, certain speaking styles. And so I really, really hope that what you're saying happens. And I don't know. I mean, we've definitely had, so, I mean, we've had folks for sure with accents and it does tend to do an okay job. Um, you know, I, we did a, a Ukrainian philosopher who's Ukrainian is his first language. And I, and I remember using the AI for that. And I'm pretty sure, um, Avon, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it does actually identify, it does identify two different voices. Yeah. Sometimes it'll say like Ezra Klein, Masha Gessen, but at least it'll be like person one and person two. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I can speak to that for Descript just sure, because that's yeah. how like we do, we have two hosts and then an interviewee on a lot of our episodes. So we have that and we're, we're not as structured perhaps uh, in some ways. So there's, you know, there's a fair amount of crosstalk. There's a fair amount of somebody's giggling while something else happens or whatever. Uh, it doesn't always get it right, but it does do an identify voices right at the beginning and you get to label them. And it does a pretty good job of keeping the voices separate when there's overlap it it transcribes it but you know it doesn't always assign it correctly and things do get messed up so you have to kind of go in and decide but you know what are you going to do like if, if two people are talking at once no transcription service is going to be able to sort of necessarily right. indicate that unless a human gets involved but i do find it it and, and you know i i don't have the problem of accents most of the time though sometimes our guests do we do a podcast about etymology so we're always talking about like proto-indo-european roots and latin words and greek words obviously the script is like i have no idea what you're talking about this makes no sense yes. um but you know it, because it's a, a smallish percentage that's not too hard a thing to to correct but you know there are limitations to what it can do for sure but yeah, yeah it does but it does handle multiple you can also import multiple tracks if you so you can also if you record multi-track, you can transcribe each of the tracks and then, you know, right. together. I haven't done it that way, but you can do that. 
That's great. I mean, I think if you have either, there might be the free tier. If you have 10 bucks a month in the budget, I think it's, it's worth it. Even if you do, no matter who the speakers are, I often have to do some copy editing with the AI because it's like, it doesn't get that stuff and it'll pump out really weird words. Sometimes it puts commas in weird places, but I think to me, I used to edit purely with my own notes and then just straight into Hindenburg. And this is so much less time consuming to kind of target your editing on a transcript and then just go like, boop, 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 cut, cut, cut. So I don't know. Any other questions? Other questions? Yes, thank you, Amelia, for the link. If I, I'm sorry, I'm kind of talking too much, but oh, no, if I can say, I think the other, you know, getting back to our overall theme of structuring for learning, um, I think that the transcript really helps for that because yes. you're talking about pre, you know, your your approach, which is really interesting to hear about is, you know, essentially doing that structuring ahead of time. But if you're going to do the structuring afterwards, I think for a lot of people, they want to be able to look at the whole thing and say, okay, what, what was the thrust of our conversation? What were the important bits? Where do we want to move? Maybe we do want to move stuff around. And that's just so much harder when you're trying to do it in audio only and remember what bits you said where, whereas I find just being able to skim a transcript, suddenly now you can think structurally about it um, a bit more like as if you were writing it in a, or writing a script, you know? I mean, that's yeah. what it is, obviously. It's a, a reverse script. Uh, so I think that if that's something that you're, you're interested in, is is doing some of that kind of um, explicit structuring, it might be helpful. Yeah, and I think if I have a really thorny edit, I'll even kind of reverse outline it. You know, like I'll make a little outline that's like, oh, here's topic or whatever question and just go down. And then I'll just look at that outline. Like, does that make sense? <laughs> like if that's lily padding all over and it doesn't make sense to me, it's not gonna make sense to listeners. I don't have to do that a ton, but it totally happens. So I think there are a lot of tips and tricks that editors have. I did actually want to ask, oh, um, yeah, Shrikant. And then I have, a, I have a question for Elizabeth too, but go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I have a question for both of you. And this is slightly uh, tangential to the topic, but I'm curious to know what you guys think about uh, the current use of artificial intelligence and how you think it will help podcasts facilitate learning, uh, if mm. at all. Just curious to know your thoughts on the subject. Elizabeth, do you want to start? Um, let me think on that. You go ahead. Let me give me a minute to think on it. Well, I was wondering, do you have a kind of an example? Because the only thing I can think of is transcription, but I'm sure I'm missing something. So what what might be an example of where AI is being brought into the Podcast. I was just reading an article about uh, how students are using uh, uh, these artificial intelligence text generators to turn in their essays. So they are essentially uh, uh, using artificial intelligence to create content uh, and mm. passing it off as their own. So I'm trying oh, to figure whether um, uh, whether whether artificial intelligence can help uh, you uh, help help um, create audio and help you facilitate learning somehow or I'm, I'm actually not sure I, I just mm. um, try to bring those two concepts together and that that's the first thing I thought of that's a really really interesting I did not know about that that sounds dystopian <laughs> to me um, as a former composition teacher and I would love to see that article if you can find it I'll just I mean, drop my... a link in the chat oh thank you so much uh, my initial thought is that I think writing, and I might be wrong, but but I think that writing is easier to fake than a conversation, right? I mean, you can plagiarize by literally copying and pasting. Apparently, you can plagiarize by having a robot write your papers. But it's really hard for me to think of people going into a conversation and like having an AI generate that. I'm sure, I mean, obviously that happens, but I think if you say, okay, students, you know, you're both going to hook up to Audacity or you're going to record remotely on your smartphones, you know, curate that conversation. Like who's going to ask questions? What are those questions going to be? You two both need to respond. And I think there've been some great panels. I heard one earlier, um, or sorry, the first panel today with the fabulous HPN resource talking about using podcasts as a form of like composition, right? 
I just, I, I mean, if anyone's taught that kind of project, I just really, it's hard for me to think about it. Someone said in the chat when I asked that first question that podcasting is so humane. It's really, you're hearing voices, you're hearing spontaneous thought, you're hearing people think out loud. That's something I like so much about it. It feels so much imbo more embodied and sort of even listening to a monocaster, it's like that person's in your ear. That's a human. <laughs> I don't think it's a robot. Elizabeth does not sound like a robot when she's reading or tracking at all. And so I guess just to sum up, my first instinct would be that podcasting as an assignment, perhaps, would be harder to fake and harder to replace with AI. What do you think, Elizabeth? I think it would be easier for me and somebody like with a project like mine to kind of cheat and use AI than it would be for you. Just because, um, you know, I'm by myself, I, like, even if I were using AI to just produce like a script or something like that, that I could read, like, that's something that I could do much easier than somebody that's doing a conversation or a dialogue that you could. Um, I, I've also been reading about students using AI to produce papers, texts, et cetera. And if I wanted to produce a paper or a text that I could read as a script for my solo cast, then I absolutely could do that. Whereas you depend on kind of that um, spontaneity and spur of the moment that, you know, you got to pass the Turing test, whereas I don't have to do that necessarily. So it would be easier for somebody in my position than it would be for Annie. That's interesting. Yeah. Oh yeah, go ahead. So no, sorry. I just wanted to add that uh, what 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 uh, Elizabeth just described uh, is something that is very much uh, in vogue on YouTube currently, where a lot of people make channels where uh, content is auto generated depending on whatever is trending at the time, and uh, it is auto voiced using one of these uh, text to speech speech generators, and uh, they just churn out videos by the by the dozen. So uh, it's kind of happening, but uh, uh, primarily in the YouTube sphere rather than podcasting and audio specifically. Wow, that's so interesting. I feel like we could talk about this for another two hours, um, robots and everything. Uh, do other folks? Actually, let me ask Elizabeth, I, I wanted to ask you really, actually, this is a little bit related to what you were just talking about, but how do you think about structure in a monocast? Because again, my only experience is either writing stuff or, mm -hmm. um, curating questions and responses. And again, I've hosted stuff myself. So it's a lot of it is like in the moment, but a lot of it is prep. So how do you think about structure in both pre and post-production? Yeah, um, so I do, like you, a lot of the work is front-loaded, right? Like I do a lot of research and a lot of writing. Um, there's not a lot of work that goes into post-production. There's a little bit of editing, but there's not a lot. Um, I spend most of my time doing research and writing, and then the recording and the post-production takes 30 minutes to an hour tops. Um, but I will spend anywhere from two to four hours just, you know, working on research and writing, you know, two to four hours minimum. Um, for that 25 minute podcast uh, because, you know, these are not small topics. It takes some time to talk about Elaine Six Sioux and Sojourner Truth and whoever else is gonna make it into that little 25 minute podcast, you know? Um, so there's, like you, there's a lot that goes into the prep work and then you kind of have to structure the podcast itself in a way that is sensible for the listener, right? Like you have to have an intro that kind of clarifies what you're going to be talking about. And then you've got to make sense of the topic. And then you've got to have your application. And then you've got to conclude it in a way that kind of wraps things up. And that takes some effort in writing, you know, it's, mm. <laughs> it's a thoughtful process. But the post-production isn't that big of a deal. And, you know, the recording, it's the post-production depends on the recording. If I mess yeah. up a whole bunch of the recording, then the post-production takes longer. If it's a pretty clear reading, 
then post-production takes no time at all. That's so interesting. Again, people will be like, what does a producer do? And I'm like, it 1000% depends on the show. <laughs> um, I see a question from Wesley. Let's have one more question and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, Wesley. What are you yeah, mine was about? more kind of a response to your question and to Elizabeth's response. I also do a a solo podcast, me, a microphone in a dream, I guess. And um, <laughs> in terms of structuring, like one of the things I often have to really think about is how much more understanding I have of the material than the people listening to the podcast. Mm -hmm. like, as Elizabeth mentioned, like most of the work is in the prep. So it's like, yeah, I know all this back to front, forward to back. And I have to think about that a lot when I'm presenting information to make sure that somebody who's just engaging with it 25, 30 minutes a week still knows and understands what I'm talking about. And a lot of that is in kind of intro and outro structure, as well as making sure I refer to things the same every time or revisit information more than maybe I would need to, but maybe my my listeners do. Yeah, I would just, the one quick thing I would add to that, I was listening to both of you. In some ways, it can be harder if you know a lot about your topic. Because I mm -hmm. think for me, if I do Margaret Atwood or I do a poet or a musician, I'm aware that I've like studied this for... <laughs> nine years. And so the project of translating that is harder. You know, when we did the Russia-Ukraine war, I literally knew absolutely nothing about the Russia-Ukraine. I mean, I knew, I knew what an engaged newsreader would know, know, but one thing we've started to do a lot more on the show, and maybe this might be helpful for others, is to think about beginner's mind, which is like a concept from someone else. But, and sometimes I'll start by writing a bunch of questions before I even do the prep that's like, what do I want to know about the Russia-Ukraine war right now? What do I want to know from Margaret Atwood? What do I want to know about this cognitive science thing? And so beginner's mind, I think, can help you connect with your listener more because you're actually thinking like a listener. You're not thinking like someone who just read a 400-page heavily footnoted book about you know why sex and abortion are horrible. It's like I'm going in being like, what is the deal with this? And so I think beginner's mind is maybe something other folks can use too. Um, anything, what, what more comment or anything, Elizabeth, and then we'll let you all get back to your day. Um, no, I just want to thank everybody for coming. It's been a delight to see you all. And I really want to thank Annie for spending some time with us today. Um, I know she works so hard and does such a fantastic job on this huge project of hers. So I really want to thank Annie for sharing this time with me. Oh, well, right back at you. I know you have a lot going on and, um, I can't wait to hear more of your show and and everyone else's show too. So thank you to the committee and Elizabeth and all of you for being here. We really appreciate it. And I hope you have a good uh, rest of your day.